Saturday morning show. And I have a surprise guest with me here. This is Dr. Rob Koch, who's the head of veterinary medicine at the San Antonio Zoo. Dr. Koch, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I learned a few things about those bugs. <laughs> now, we all have to be understanding here. Uh, Dr. Koch is in an area. He, he's uh, he's taken some time away from his vaccine clinic to uh, hang out here with us. And his, uh, we have a little bit of a delay on the audio, so we need to be understanding uh, when that, uh, should that become an issue. Um, now, we do have a number of people from YouTube and Facebook. And for the uh, people on Facebook, uh, just know that we need to see your, uh, to be able to see your name, uh, you have to write it in the caption because Facebook, Facebook won't let us know who you are because of privacy concerns. So. All right, but uh, please say hello in the in the chat. Uh, news items: uh, I know a number of uh, people across the country were dealing with some uh, uh, a heat wave, we don't and get often here in California. There we go. Yeah, the heat wave finally broke here in California, and I actually got a double rainbow out of it, and so uh, I'm very glad to see that. Uh, Dr. Koch, how was, uh, did you get a heat wave through your area? Well, well it's 90s. So, <laughs> okay. Days. So, it's low enough now. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I had, oh, look at that. Jenny is back. She uh, was at HOM. Uh, this is Jenny from Germany, Emerald Garrett. And uh, yeah, Jenny, I came prepared because uh, I promised Jenny that I'd come uh, with some dad jokes. So yeah, I've got dad jokes coming up, <laughs> but I do have some news here. Hello, McZoo Exotic Pets. That's Sean McNeely. Very good to see you. And uh, everybody, I, if you've been following this channel, you've known that I have had a, a wonderful, wonderful girl. Campani. That is, let's just bring her up here. This is a jeweled chameleon, Versifer Campani, and this is a captive hatched. This is very special because this is the first time that I've known that captive hatched uh, Campani have been available and uh, uh, bred by Michael Nash. And I was uh, lucky enough to be able to get a female. Well, I've been waiting for a male and it has, uh, it, I got a surprise when Michael said, hey, there's a male available very quickly. And so I had to, I had 24 hours to, uh, to be ready for it. And this is, see, they, there we go. There is the new male and he is beautiful. We have that, uh, here, let me bring them back up. Think about the, the male company is they have this black, uh, the, the black color to them. Captive bred, captive hatch. So uh, I'll be working on true F2 Campani, which uh, I, of course, am very excited about. Uh, now, one thing that I had to do very quickly is I had to put together a uh, a cage for uh, for this by uh, for this new chameleon. I had to do it within 24 hours. Luckily, I've been already planning on doing this. And so uh, I actually uh, just did a bioactive very quickly, and I put together a bit of a bioactive cage setup. Uh, a, All right, the uh, first thing that we want to do, and we want to create oh, okay, a... Okay, okay. I'm working on getting this schedule up. Or, or, or this, uh, this up here. Let's see. Let's go down to this. And I'm going to play a... Uh, uh, a video here that's, <clears throat> that gives you a short review on how to put together a uh, bioactive environment. All right, the first thing that we want to do when we want to create a bioactive environment is we want the right cage. Uh, in this case, I want a cage that's going to be a, a humid cage because I'm going to do uh, the deep forest type bioactive. And for this, I need a hybrid cage. So what I'm looking for is a cage that has all sides uh, solid 
and it has the vents, vents at the bottom, bottom front, front and, and the screen, screen top, top. So, so I get, I get the, chimney the chimney effect. effect. And, and the cage that I've uh, decided on is the Leap Habitat. The uh, 22, 22 inch, inch by 17 inch, inch by 24 inch, inch tall. Now, once, now, once I, have I have this cage assembled, the first thing, the first thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going, going to be putting down, down a layer of LECA balls, balls, also, also called, called hydro balls. balls. And, and I just, I just do, do about an inch, inch uh, like, like three quarters, quarters of an inch to an inch. inch. Uh, uh, and, and this, this is going to be my drainage layer. On top of the LECA balls goes a sunscreen. Actually, it's called a sunshade cloth. And whatever it is, it can be a number of different things. Uh, it is what's going to separate the soil from the LECA balls. And that way I don't have a muddy mess at the bottom of my cage. On top of that substrate barrier, I'm going to be putting in my bioactive substrate. Now I'm going to be using two types of soils in this particular build. The first is my Leap Living Earth soil and the other, the other is, is Josh's, Josh's Frogs, Frog's ABG mix. mix. Now, now I did Purchase, purchase enough of the Leap, Leap Living, Living Earth, Earth to do this, this entire project, project except my, my wife, wife decided, decided she liked the way, the way it smelled, smelled and, and so she, she absconded with uh, most, most of my, my Living, Living Earth. Earth. All right, Aaron, uh, you know this story. My wife comes in, she sees what she likes, and she just takes it. My nursery cages, gone because she liked them. My Living Earth, she took a whiff, she said, I like this, and she took all of my living earth except that one bag uh to my defense that's her that's yvette strand misty mountain fans and how in the world do you say no to that face so uh yeah she uh she got my living earth but this is what she's breeding and using that living earth for it's for fantasticus and she is an incredible breeder of fantasticus and so uh, I am happy to uh, give up some of my stuff. She made good on it by going to a reptile show that was local and uh, brought back Sasha's Frog's ABG mix so I could actually do this project. Now I'm going to put in a little bit of my soil and then I'm going to put in my plants and then I'm going to put in a little bit more of my soil. Ideally, these plants would have been in quarantine and the roots cleaned and the soil replaced. That's the safest way to do it. I haven't had problems going directly from the store yet, but I do like to do the quarantine session. In this case, I'm not going to be able to do that. The chameleon's here. And so I'm going to be risking the possibility that I will have to change out the entire substrate uh, at a later date. Once, Once I put, put the, the plants, plants in, situated, situated everything, and then and filled up the uh, rest of the area with the bioactive soil, soil then, then I add a leaf layer. layer. I'm going to be adding in two types of leaves. The first is uh, an ash that's, that's going, going to decompose very quickly, very quickly. And, the and the second, second is magnolia, magnolia which, which is going to take a little bit longer to decompose. Once everything's in, I go ahead, spray it down, and water the plants. And then it's time to add in my cleanup crew. Usually, Usually I, like I like to put, put in, in the springtails spring first, wait a little, little while for them to get established, established then, then put in the isopods, and, and then, then put in the chameleon at a later date. In, in this case, I'm going to have to do it all at once, once because this is a rush job. job. So, so isopods, isopods go in, springtails spring go in, in, and then, and then it's time, time to put in a network of branches for the chameleon to climb on. This is going to be a small chameleon, and so I just need very thin branches. If you need thicker branches, you can actually go as far as screwing them into the walls of the cage, but I don't need to do that for these thin branches. Once the branches are in, I'm going to be doing a check for my UV index, and uh, I take a UV index meter, solar meter 6.5, and I'm gonna make sure that the UVB exposure by the basking branch is right around UV index of three. Now, ideally I want the type of the cage to be at UV index of six because I don't want higher UVB levels coming into the cage. Now, this is a new UVB bulb that I've got here. And so expect that within the first 100 hours that the levels are gonna be much higher than they will be. So do these UVB checks every couple days over the first month, and you'll be able to adjust the distance between the basking branch and the UVB bulb to give yourself the UV index that you're looking for. Once all that's set up, it's time to bring in the chameleon and introduce him to his new home. And there's our quick bioactive cage build review. All right. You know, uh, Dr. Koch, I'm wondering at the San Antonio Zoo, uh, how, what's the philosophy towards naturalistic caging? You know, most of our they are naturalistic. Okay. You know, we have, and they you want to see pretty cages, paper towels, and um, 
but we do have a area. We have a lot of straight, it's rock, spray. Um, so everything where we need to. Yes, my daughter made sure I wore full garish chameleon. <laughs> oh, hey everybody, how is uh, Dr. Koch's uh, audio on your side? Let me know in the chat uh, how things are, how things are going. Um, all right, well, uh, when I was doing this bioactive, I used my leap cage, and so ah, the audio isn't so good. All right. So I, I used my uh, leap cage and uh, I was able, I was thinking about Tim Marks, who's the guy who invented the leap cage, but he does more than just caging. He actually is uh, a very good breeder of uh, first fur Wilsey. And so let's see, I'm going to, I asked him to give us an update as to how things are going. And so let me bring Hey guys, him. it's Tim Marks from Leap. And today I'm going to show you a quick little tour of our first fur Wilsei, which is the uh, canopy chameleon. Um, I know some people pronounce it Wilsey. You can pronounce it any way you want. And uh, right here we have, oh, I guess I can't turn my camera around, but an active little female who uh, has been running around her cage all day today. So she might be getting gravid and you can see she is getting some darker coloration right before your eyes. You'll notice that we keep all of our Wilsei in uh, 15 by 24 inch enclosures, although there are some shorter ones on top just because we ran out of inventory back when we were setting up these cages. And those were actually at the time baby Wilsei. So we actually have two captive bred baby Wilsei, um, both of whom have bred for us now, one of whom has laid eggs. I'm gonna grab this little girl so that you can see her. Wilsei is a small, semi-colorful, very robustly built chameleon. They're thick, they have thick little heads and thick little bodies. And I don't know about you, but I just love them. I don't think you need a lot of colors to be beautiful, but uh, the greens and the yellows. Oh, now you're going the wrong way. Oh boy, Ooh, we got a friend. Come here, girl. All right, now I can, nope, 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 nope. Wrong direction. All right, there you go. As you guys may know, it's not always easy wrangling chameleons. Um, the males are built a little differently than the females and actually have horns. So this is my favorite boy. He is up here in his, in his tree. And you can see just how beautiful they are. small, very small species. Uh, I really enjoy working with them. So some empty cages, but these are larger ones as well. Perfectly good for keeping a whale sea eye. 22 inches wide, 24 tall. All of the leap habitats are 17 inches front to back. We use UV light. Um, we actually stagger the UV lighting so it's not on as long as the, uh, the uh, LED daylight. Hey, Kelsey just joined me in the reptile room because I just found a baby Fantasticus that just hatched out. So Kelsey came back to put it in a cup. The, uh, we also use for the Will CI heat lamps that are only on for a couple of hours a day. And we find that that's actually pretty important. Whereas with our carpet chameleons, we've never had that experience of, being, of, of the heat lamps being critical. We've been working with this species now for about five years. We bred them um about that long ago and we kind of botched the incubation and the eggs took over two years to hatch and we only had two survivors and those are our two females up there but since then the those girls have done great they produce eggs of their own and uh, now we have a, a colony that we purchased um and have been working again and i want to say kelsey what do we have like uh 40 eggs in the incubator right now Probably. we have a lot honestly yeah and they just keep coming so anyway just wanted to say hi Hi, Bill, and uh, thanks for asking me to do this. I hope you all enjoyed it, and we'll talk again later. Bye. All right. Well, that is uh, the reason why that's substantial is because they are establishing 
we'll see as uh, in captivity, they have enough eggs and enough bloodlines. It's just like Campani that Michael Nash is working with and the, uh, the carpet chameleons that Frank and Tim are working on. And this is, uh, this is a trend that's positive in the community. We're getting away from being total collectors. And we have people that are seriously working on establishing species. And that is one of the most positive trends that I've seen in the chameleon community. And I'm very excited about that. Now, we need to figure out, Dr. Koch, we have to figure out your audio. Um, Go ahead. Uh, uh, tell us. Right. Oh, that actually sounded good. Turn the car car off. So, so, so. but anyway. Yeah, there's a. Uh, well, we're gonna try it. We're gonna try it. So, all right, everybody. The. Um, oh, I had one more. One more thing I needed to tell everybody here is I want to bring your attention to a new social media app called, um, called Vero. And let's see, we're gonna, this is very much like Instagram. It's this uh, one at the bottom. And the thing is, we in the chameleon community are going to need to find different places for our uh, social media homes. Uh, because uh, Instagram is not friendly to us. Uh, we just had other, you know, if you guys know Framscams, they just had their account taken down again uh, with no warning, no explanation. And so uh, like Facebook and Instagram and even TikTok are hostile towards breeders. And so uh, we're going to have to go through the difficult uh, task of finding a different social media home that's safer. Now, I mean, I'm fine on Instagram because I don't, I'm not a seller of chameleons. I'm an educator of chameleons, but Chameleon Academy has always been about the community and uh, a significant portion of the community of people doing good things in the community uh, are not comfortable, are not safe on Instagram. So uh, I'm I'm going to encourage you all to go check out Vero. Uh, it's There aren't a whole lot of people there, but we're starting a small reptile group. And maybe within five years, uh, we'll be able to have a substantial enough uh, following there that it'll be, you know, it'll be worth it for everybody. But right now, we're all just trying to start something in a place where we're not in danger of getting kicked off because we're breeders of uh, chameleons. So. I uh, encourage you all, check it out, and, uh, you know, <laughs> let's see what we can do. I have all of, I think, what, 35, 38 followers? Woohoo! But <laughs> things start small, and, uh, you know, we're going to do the best we can there. So, all right. Yes, Jenny, that is why you don't see posts from Frams Cams anymore. Uh, go find out. It's Frams Cams Backup. I'm going to have a link to it on my Instagram when this is done, but uh, just, just do a search for Frams Cams and find their backup account. They've already picking up the pieces. They've, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they got their account uh, taken down at the beginning of the year. And so they started a new account. They got up to over 60,000 followers. And this morning their account's been taken down again. And, uh, and they've been very careful not to, uh, not to do anything against the terms and services. So it's a really tough situation there. So, all right. Today we're talking about parasites, those wonderfully disgusting, amazing things. And I'm absolutely fascinated by them. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, usually when we talk about parasites, we have this tutorial about direct life cycles, indirect life cycles, and go through the different types of parasites. But I wanted to come at it from a different perspective and talk about topics about parasitism, how we should be looking at it, what we should be wondering about parasites. And one of, I mean, just to dive into it, one of the things that I've been wondering, and Dr. Koch, I'm going to ask if you have any insight into this, is do we know 
if reptile hookworms travel to find a host like human hookworms do? What you talked about on the yesterday, I mean, they track that area, that, if you will. So they're not going to start too far because they're small. They're not used to traveling cells, obviously. I don't think the, a lot of the works that do they go two feet. Um, I don't think a lot, a lot of it's, it's it's money and some poor candidate who needs a job. Oh, we have to find more people doing biology. <laughs> oh. Dr. Cook, you're, unfortunately, your audio is just breaking up to the point where we're not uh, able to hear what you say. Like, is, is there a... Right here, buds. Okay, let's try that, because I would absolutely love right. to be able to get your insight on this. Any better? Or is there still that? Oh, oh, let's try again, and... Is that any better? better or is there static uh it's just that your uh your voice keeps cutting out and so we get like every fifth word uh and About that uh, it, it it looks like the network your network connection is strong um yeah I, the thing is the wi-fi connection wi-fi is strong. I'm, yeah i'm connected to data so hmm. but it's showing for are, are you able to get to a an area where you can connect to wi-fi um, um not day unfortunately unfortunately where i'm at all right all right you know what i'm gonna i i think we should have you back on back when when we get a good connection because yeah. Yeah, no. okay uh this is just painful oh no i have i have incredible information at my fingertips and i don't have audio <laughs> all right Writing. dr coke let's do this let's do this another saturday i'm going to talk to you and yep. figure out when we can Problem. have you back to where you're at a different uh at a different like if you're at home or something I understand. Unfortunately, world. So, all right. Thank you data. very much for jo <laughs> dropping by, <laughs> and we will we will get you back on. And, and, all right. And um, this side. Okay. I'm sorry. We can't hear. Okay. Goodbye, sir. Oh no. Yeah. Oh. Oh my goodness, you guys. That just breaks my heart. Dr. Koch is incredible. And he's he's a chameleon guy. He's the head of veterinary of uh, the, the veterinarians at the San Antonio Zoo. So he knows that he's worked on Komodo dragons. So we are definitely going to bring him back uh and and uh and talk to him. But uh but yeah, that that was uh that question that I had. Uh, how many of you have uh, listened to the podcast? Uh, and how many it, really the purpose of the podcast episode was to expand our thought process. And what what I'm getting at for those who haven't heard the podcast is that there isn't a whole lot of uh, research done on the life cycle of the reptile parasites. And you know, there just isn't any money uh, to support that kind of research. And it's expensive because it's so hard to follow the life cycle of a microscopic parasite. These guys uh, change form and they require, they're very hard to replicate the entire life form in the laboratory because they require signals, uh, different signals from the human body. It, it could be chemical signals. It could be even the, the width of the blood vessels that says, oh, okay, it's time for me to break out of here. And so it is, yeah, okay, Rob, Rob can watch from the side. Yeah, so 
Uh, and so it's very difficult to uh, figure out what the life cycles of these guys are. And we in the reptile world, we have to, the, all we've got is uh, to look at the human parasites and all of the research done there and see what matches. Uh, try to get it. Uh, try uh, and say, okay, do we do we see parallels here? Uh, and there are there are differences. Like I gave the example of pinworms in humans. Pinworms don't lay eggs inside the uh, the intestines. Uh, the female actually crawls. I mean, I don't know how graphic I need to get here, but the, she crawls outside the body and then lays the eggs there. Uh, so and then the child scratches and uh, and then puts their hands in their mouth that's why children have pinworms a lot and uh but in reptiles we do see pinworm eggs in the uh, the fecals because there's no way for a chameleon to scratch its bottom and then put its hand in its mouth so uh there are some differences there but i uh i brought up the concern that I've been thinking about, because one parasite that I have a an unnatural fascination for, is the um, is the hookworm. And the thing about the hookworm is that uh, the larva, uh, the the eggs come out in the feces, and then for the first two molts, uh, for the first uh, they hatch. And then they uh, they do another molt, and they're eating microbes within the feces. But in the third stage, they become infectious, which means they start looking for a host, and they actually travel uh, the four feet looking for a host. And they get up on grass, and they sit there, and they wave, and they just wait for somebody to come by so they can latch on, and they can enter your bloodstream through the skin, and. The question is, well, how about reptile hookworms? Can they do that? And it may not be that uh, we don't know at this point. And let's see. Okay, I'm going to bring up some uh, from Dr. Koch. He's now in the chat here. Um, oh, he's saying that a fair amount of the Malagasy parasite research in chameleons was done in the 60s. Only... Only a handful of research since. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty old there. But, um, so the question is, I mean, how much of a parallel? I mean, can you imagine uh, how that changes our view of things if we find out that reptile hookworms actually search out a host? I mean, it's not far-fetched. Uh, I have some references to Colicephalus, which is the snake hookworm, and it can get into uh, the reptile through the skin, at least with the references I'm seeing. And so if it can get through the skin, uh, wouldn't it make sense that they maintain the mobility to go look for their host? <laughs> yeah. And uh, Dr. Koch saying, and published in French language. Yeah, I found like the... Uh, the um, the description of Oswaldo cruzii, which is the uh, lizard hookworm, that was done in Fr uh, German. So I'm having to uh, get more familiar with the European languages here. Uh, now, let's see. We have a question here. Oops. Nope, that's, that's the wrong one. Uh, where was it? Isn't that quite common with some crickets in captivity? Uh, Chameleon King, what do you mean with uh, what is common? Now, I did. we do have something bouncing around, and this may be what you're getting at, is uh, talking about uh, getting parasites from crickets that you buy from big feeders. And if, if that's not what you're talking about, Chameleon King, please uh, put a... Uh, clarification in the chat. Uh, but if that is what you're talking about, this is something that's been bouncing around for a while, but I got to tell you, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and, and we're going to, this is where we talk, uh, start going into where uh, 
Dr. Koch actually has some experience that I'd like to share. And Dr. Koch, if you're uh, still here, are you able to uh, type in your experience with parasites jumping between species? I know you had one example of a veiled chameleon that got a certain kind of parasite that was from another. Um, okay, RC. Okay, Rob says... There's been some studies already done and they didn't find any herp parasites. Okay. And, and that makes sense because for you to be able to get a parasite that's going to infect you, uh, your, uh, your chameleon or your lizard, you need that sort of parasite being, being manufactured, being reproduced at the cricket farm. So that cricket farm would need to be breeding reptiles there and be tra being transferred and, and having the lizard poop somehow get to your cricket breeding. Uh, that's not an impossible situation, but it is highly improbable for that to happen. So if you, uh, unfortunately, it's very easy to say the crickets did it. Uh, but I would say, please use a healthy amount of critical thinking when you're approaching that because uh, there is probably another explanation. And if you go with the easy answer of it's somebody else's fault, it's these crickets, then you're going to miss you're you're just gonna have you're gonna go through it again because the real reason is still still out there. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, don't don't, uh, don't jump to that conclusion. Uh, really try it out. Um, and, and I don't know if, I, I do know that, uh, I mean, this isn't, let's, let's say there are cricket farms that have reptiles on the premises. So I'm not going to say it's impossible, but uh, it's, it's highly improbable that the exact same parasite that would infect your chameleon is being produced there and being transferred over to your crickets. But um, so anyway, uh, we have this challenge that we're trying to figure out the life cycles of these parasites uh, without a whole lot of research dollars. And um, uh, uh, so there's a bit of a ch challenge uh, and, and I'll jump to um, the next uh, stage, the next question after the whole crickets. Did I get it from a crickets? And uh, the next thing to think about that's in our community is the uh, the debate as to whether we should feed wild-caught insects. And um, let's see. Okay, Chameleon King is... Coming back says, bring it up because it can happen, but also because my friend found a parasite in a dead cricket. Forget the name of it, but it was leaking out of it. Okay. Well, there is also a difference between, there are parasites that infect crickets, but they're not going to be infectious to your chameleon. So uh, finding a worm in a cricket is absolutely not uh, out of the or ordinary. That is standard. Uh, crickets have parasites. So the question would be, is that something that would infect a chameleon? And if it's a worm inside of a cricket, then it's probably going through its life cycles within the cricket. So it's probably a cricket parasite uh, and it won't, won't be able to infect your chameleon. Um, I mean, and worms can be pretty bad. I had a brochesia and uh, that died and that's the, uh, the stump-tailed chameleon. I did a necropsy and I opened up the intestines. It's like the entire intestine was just filled with one worm. That was probably uh, um, uh, lumbricoides, I don't know, so some kind of... Uh, so anyway, it was just filled with an entire worm. So obviously, that's why it died. Um, yeah, and, and Chameleon King, this is a... This is a challenge because it's difficult to identify parasite eggs in the uh, in the feces and the differences between species 
of the eggs. And so there's actually a chance that you're going to see uh, parasite eggs within the feces that are not infectious to a chameleon. Uh, there's a lot of things. I mean, the crickets an entire ecosystem, all the uh, feeder insects that we feed, they can have, they can bring some of these things as well. So uh, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of detail that has to go in and it's very difficult to tell a difference. Okay, guys, this is, this is a, an important story Rob Koch has uh, shared with us uh, and I'm going to read it out loud for everybody. I don't think this is going to show up. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to read it out loud. It's nothing going to show everything on the screen, but uh, he says, in 1997, I presented a case where a captive bred veiled chameleon was housed next to a wild caught panther chameleon. The veiled chameleon died from a parasite from the panther chameleon. It was a hexametra. Uh, okay. Angusticoides. Okay. We have a species name on that one. It is a Malagasy parasite of lizards and snakes. I suspect that it was transmitted through house flies eating the panther poop and the veiled eating the fly. The parasite didn't end up in the intestine, but all throughout the body and internal organs. So was this... Uh, so how did you know that the veiled chameleon died from this parasite? And if it wasn't in the intestine, uh, was it... Do you think that it was confused that the veiled chameleon was a dead end host, uh, and and this hexametra wouldn't be able to reproduce? But then again, if it couldn't reproduce, why would it kill the veiled chameleon? Uh, so, love love to hear your your thoughts on that. Um, And uh, saw a quick note about a crested gecko having the same parasite that they thought came from a Europlatus. Uh, that that would definitely be interesting because uh, yeah, two different areas. And and what we're talking about? Oh, okay. Rob Cook says he found the parasite on necropsy. The parasite just overwhelmed the system, so it was reproducing within the veiled chameleon. That that true? So. What we're talking about here is uh, how well parasites can jump between species. And if you're um, if you're looking at how a parasite is able to function within the chameleon, they're looking for things that are like uh, chemical differences. And so when the parasite evolves with the chameleon, that's that's a different evolutionary path than the parasite evolving with an alligator lizard over in the North America or a parasite evolving, uh, evolving with a snake over in Europe. And so even though they look the same to us, the insides may be completely different and the parasites could get confused as to where to go. I mean, that's what happens when you walk on a beach and you get a dog hookworm. They get into your skin and they can't get into the bloodstream because they're confused. They can't figure out where it is. And so they just crawl all over inside your foot. And that's called ground itch. So it's, um, let's see. And so that is what's called a dead end host. Um, the, where the, 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 uh, the parasite can get into the host, but really can't complete its uh, complete cycle. Um, so let's see. So let's see. Uh, Rob saying a life cycle in the veiled, the high number of worms killed it first. Okay. So it's not sure that they would complete the life cycle in the veiled, but there was a high number of worms. So perhaps a lot of eggs. And, and this is important to us uh, because we need to know how well uh, parasites can jump between uh, lizards that come from different areas or the uh, the lizards that are in your backyard because when you're feeding wild caught insects question is how well can those parasites jump from whatever's in your yard to your chameleon and it's not an it's not an easy answer because if you look into our parasitology uh, it, it looks like uh, the cholecephalus hookworm for snakes can infect a wide number of species Whereas uh, coccidia, at least according to my my texts, 
Uh, it seems to be very species specific. So, and that makes sense because you have larger worms that are more able to adapt and you got single celled protozoa. You know, who knows how, how well they can adapt to subtle changes. Um, but the question then is, how about the alligator lizard in my backyard? And here's where uh, really we in the community need to understand that we don't know. And like there, there tends to be this, these two factions of I feed wild caught insects and other people say, I would never feed a wild caught insect. Well, we're, we're all working off of the same very base information and making our conclusions. Uh, and, but these conclusions are just guesses. And um, let's see, Rob's including here, coccidia tends to be genus specific. But um, still learning. Okay, so I, I'm I'm reading the comments here and just uh, getting some information from Rob. But um, so okay. All right. So uh, to do to do always exceptions to the rule. Yeah, and so we don't know. Me personally. I feed wild caught insects every chance I get because the nutrition, the diurnal insects, I love it. Um, but then I am not going to criticize somebody who out of abundance of caution says don't feed wild caught insects. Both are valid. We don't have information to confirm either one. And we as a community, we should continue doing what we feel good and sharing with the community our experiences. If I find out that there are some parasites that are jumping to my chameleons because they're eating flies, well, then I am going to share that with the community. That's a problem. But I also have to be careful that just because I am not having a problem with uh, with uh, parasites jumping to my chameleons here in arid Southern California, does that mean, that doesn't mean that people in nice, humid, warm Florida are safe from this because who knows what's over there. So we all as a community really need to uh, observe what, what's, what's going on and share with the community so we can build this body of knowledge because there isn't going to be scientific funding uh, to help out with this one. Um See, uh, uh, Ricky is asking, what about having a chameleon outside eight a few anoles? How dangerous is that to transmit parasites? Uh, the, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, that is, it would depend upon the parasites that are inside the anole and how well those parasites can jump to uh, a different genus of lizard. And the fact is, we don't know. Uh, and one thing that would be interesting is if you had took regular fecals, somebody would have to do the experiment of getting fecals of a veiled chameleon that were negative and then introducing an anole that had positive uh, hookworm, nematoids, whatever, and then the veiled chameleon ate that anole. And then we, if we had a positive on the veiled chameleon, we would learn something. And eventually, who knows, I may do that one day because that would be very good information. Um, and let's see, Big Al is, uh, is saying nice things about me. <laughs> Thank you, Big Al. Uli's asking, if you have a dewormed schedule for all your chameleons and are just the wild caught ones, do you test everybody? And if something is weird, you pull the trigger and have an antiparasitic. Yeah. Uh, what I do is for my outdoor chameleons, I rarely do tests and that's mainly because it's hard to find poop uh, because I have a naturalistic, it all set up naturalistically, but uh, I got to get my Mars. I just moved. So I got to get my microscope station back up, but I used to do fecals all the time, anytime, any chance I got uh, because it's just so much fun seeing what's in there. Uh, and I didn't notice any, any blooms of parasites with ones that were fed wild caught. And so I've continued. Uh, and, but, but like I'm saying, 
that is my one experience in this area. Uh, and I would never say that you would get my exact experience in other areas of the United States or the world. Uh, it's one of these things we all, it would be great if we all had microscopes and we were all doing this and we did this on outside and inside, we would learn so much. And, uh, maybe, maybe we'll, uh, through the Chameleon Academy, I intend to do more episodes on helping people get the microscope, get set up, do the fecals. And, and I'd love to be able to gather everybody's experiences and start building this up. Uh, I think there's a Facebook group that, that likes to do this. Let's see. Let's see. Rob saying, by the way, Dr. Koch, thank you for putting RC on there. Um, says, I tend to prophylactically treat wild-caught reptiles. I also pair that with fecal sampling to make sure that I'm using the best or most appropriate dewormer. I tend to recommend multiple fecal samples over the first year in captivity or at least annually. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Of course, I, I would expect Dr. Cope to, to have that down. Um, and Dr. Koch is, I believe this is Dr. Koch saying, I would say I would recommend routine fecal sample testing on those animals who feed on wild prey. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good idea to do that. And uh, I would... So the, the message there is we, there's still so much that we need to learn and uh, we in the community need to support each other and the different conclusions that other people make. So let's, uh, you know, let, let's, let's be, let's be good to people. Now, um, one thing I want to impress, we'll just go over a couple of par uh, parasite basics here um, as we, we were going to kind of close off the day, uh, it's important to know what kind of parasite you have. And so when you, uh, when you get a chameleon, whether it's uh, wild caught or even captive bred, captive bred chameleons have parasites. It's very easy for them to catch parasites. And so um, you don't, don't assume because it's a captive bred, don't assume because it's a baby that it doesn't have parasites. Um, also, don't get, don't get uh, hysterical or uh, too terribly excited if you find out that it does have parasites. Um, because the problem with parasites is when they become uh, an overwhelming load. And it's more likely to become an overwhelming load in captivity because we, we cram this piece of poop that has thousands of eggs. And the reason why it has thousands of eggs is because it's being dropped in a forest of Madagascar. And it takes thousands of eggs every day just for the chance of a couple to make it back into the mouth of a chameleon. Can you imagine how hard that is? You have a chameleon 20 feet in the air, pooping down to the forest floor. And somehow that parasite has to figure out how to get its eggs back up to that chameleon in that chameleon's mouth. So they, they overproduce eggs as much as possible on the chance that uh, that one of those eggs takes a trip with a fly. So that's why parasite can, uh, loads can get so huge in captivity. It's because we are taking that entire dynamic of hundreds of thousands of eggs being produced and we're putting it into a closed container where we are closing, getting the feeder insect that the chameleon is going to eat right in the vicinity of the, uh, the poop. And so... Uh, the, the, that that's captivity. There's no balance there. Um, let's see. Dr. Koch is saying captive bred herps, initial fecal sample to screen and anytime GI problems or unknown health problems arise. Yep. And, and then he's, uh, Dr. Koch is coming on to say some parasites are normal in many species, such as herbivore lizards and tortoises. Oxyurids are good old pinworms and ciliate protozoas are normal flora or the, of their gut. So, well, Dr. Coke, are you able to uh, uh, weigh in on the problems? Is there a problem with giving flagell and removing the, uh, the gut flora? Um, what, what do we, what is your 
perspective on that because there was some crazy things to where after they after they did some flagell treatments some people were giving rubbing the crickets in some other chameleon poop just to reestablish the gut flora that was good so yeah i'd love to hear if you have anything to say <laughs> and he's saying try to type as fast as i can We'll, we'll be patient. We'll be patient for this information. This is great information. <laughs> yeah, I didn't ask a, a simple question there. Chameleon King's asking, should I save money on a microscope to test my chameleon and see if he has anything or take him to the vet and let the professionals do it? It all depends on how many you're going to do. I personally would encourage you to get a microscope and do it yourself because it's a huge personal growth item. And you're able to do it. You're every time there's a poop, you just grade it, take a look at it, and you will be on top of things. If you have it professionally done, then maybe you're doing it once a year, uh, and so you really lose the the ability to know when it's happened. And uh, you get you get so good at it; it's amazing what you see under that microscope. And so I would encourage you to get that microscope. Uh, right now, I'm trying to put together an episode on what micro, what to look for in a microscope and how to buy a microscope. And I've been doing a lot of searching around to see what's available these days because I, I want one that projects on my computer. And so I'm looking for a very good one. So if any of you have one, a, uh, a microscope that uh, connects to your computer and is very effective, uh, please let me know. Uh, go ahead and uh, message me on Instagram or something or uh, my email at uh, bill at chameleonacademy.com. Uh, let's see. We have mosquitoes are big transfers in chameleons. In the wet season chameleons can commonly be found with mosquitoes on them. But what, what are they, are those, would those be bloodborne? Uh, question is, would, how would, Helmets, soil transmitted helmets like hookworms and pinworms. How would they be transmitted by mosquitoes? How would mosquitoes pick those up? So, uh, unless we're just talking about bloodborne, which that would make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> There's a medical treatment called weed and feed, similar to your lawn. <laughs> okay, he's talking about getting rid of parasites. Um, Let's see. Let's see. Give me a second. Oh, okay. So weed and feed is talking about the um, the flagell in, 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 instance. Uh, and says it does consist of an antibiotic such as flagell and then adding back the bacteria with pre and probiotics. Okay. So are those pre and probiotics provided by the vet? How... How does that happen? I'm used to being given uh, flagell. I haven't been given pre and probiotics. <laughs> filarial worms. Okay, so uh, it said through uh, mosquitoes, filarial worms through bloodborne. Lee Peterson saying at the plant stage of my build, worried about what soil to use in the pots is I don't want to bring anything into the environment that could harm my chameleon told so many things by different groups. Uh, the reason why you're told so many things is because nobody knows and everybody's making guesses. And when, especially on social media, when people make guesses, they then have to defend their guesses uh, to the death. So <laughs> any any uh, critical thinking is goes out the window. Uh, but I would say, I would say you're pretty safe getting some, uh, getting some, soil from if you're doing an outdoor enclosure getting some soil from your uh, home improvement center if you're doing an indoor bioactive i, I get soil from a reptile produce uh, someone who's producing reptile soils and it's you're, you're pretty safe i mean you know it's never totally safe but the fact is for you to get have parasites within that soil that means that wherever you got that soil has to be producing those parasites. So uh, you know, you'll have to gauge what the risk is 
depending upon where you get it. So let's see, Rob Koch is saying several abiding insects can become vectors for bloodborne parasites that may infect the blood cells or nematodes, similar to heartworms, similar to heartworms, cannons. Let's see. Uh, and Hamel Lorien saying, in order of parasites, God had some brown, mushy carrot in it. Just wondering if feeding the crickets to my reptiles will transmit some bacteria. Oh, uh, okay. That's, don't know. Um, I, yeah, I'd say probably not, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I'd say probably not. Um, so, all right. So we're, we are coming to the end of today's session. Uh, any last questions about any, any questions that I missed? Uh, put them on down. And Dr. Koch is giving us uh, more. We don't know the best answer for human medicine through fecal transplants from a healthy human can be put in the sick human. Okay, we're talking about the gut flora. It sounds disgusting, but it's some of the best methods of curing different infections in humans. Okay. All right. Oh. Okay, so folks, the uh, the takeaway here is uh, parasites are something that is, uh, it's a huge field of knowledge. It's a huge, uh, we can learn so much. And um, it's so fascinating. I'm going to be having a number of episodes on parasites to where I go into doing a fecal. Uh, I go into the different types of parasites. And uh, so th this is just going to be a normal topic here where we're every couple months do uh, an episode on parasites and expanding our knowledge because uh, it's so important for us to know. And it's important for us to uh, not be so black and white. Uh, certain parasite loads aren't dangerous. We can go, we can start when we start understanding the parasites and the medicines, we need to send the medicines that we're using because medicines aren't benign. Medicines are poisons. They're meant to kill things. They're meant to disrupt the, uh, the, um, metabolizing the ability to, uh, eat than the parasites. And so there's different things that it does, but they, the medicine affect the lizard as well. So we all are having to make a decision as to what's worse, the parasite load or the medicine. And by understanding both, we can make an intelligent decision. Um, yeah. oh, thank you, Ricky. I'm glad you are enjoying that. This uh, chameleon came saying, would it be possible for an adult chameleon to transmit parasites to the babies? Uh, if we're Talking about through the egg or through the live birth of Jackson's chameleons and such. I don't know the answer to this. I know that it can happen in humans. Like crypto uh, crypto can go from, uh, I'm sorry, not crypto. Toxoplasma Gandhi can go through the placenta, uh, uh, from the mother to the baby and cause real problems. And so I, I think it would be, I would be surprised if there weren't parasites that could be transferred from parent to the baby, but uh, I don't know of any studies that have let the, let us know this at this time. <clears throat> um. <laughs> there we go. Medications equal controlled toxicity. Yeah. There. Uh, what we're trying to do is kill. Uh, enough of a dose that it kills the par uh, parasites, but not so much that it uh, hurts the chameleon. But remember, every medicine, the chameleon's body has to process that. So, James is asking, what about parasites in the blood? Yeah, there's bloodborne parasites as well. And the freaking parasites are everywhere in the gut tract, in the blood. And, uh, yeah, of course they go through the lungs and I mean, it, it's, you know, the, the freaking hookworm, that guy is just horrible. The thing, it, it, it is one of the few parasites that actually go through the skin. So they find a hair follicle or, you know, I don't know what they find on a reptile. They exert, uh, they 
put out, excrete an enzyme that dissolves the skin so they can get into the skin until they get into the blood and they go go through the heart and they get circled around until they find the lungs. And then they burst out of their little capillary into the lung. They crawl around the lung so they can get up the, uh, the trachea. And then they tickle the epiglottis. And so you cough and that opens the epiglottis. They go in to the digestive tract and then they find the small intestine where they become, uh, they, they live their life and they produce a whole lot of other hookworm eggs. So what a bizarre journey they take and um but yeah parasites have found all over the body uh lee is uh, saying hello lee good to see you again and thank you for dropping by um let's see we'll we'll find uh i'll just do a couple more uh, basic questions here I have a female that seems to be fat but she's not pregnant she eats well and is doing well could it be parasites uh, usually not fat. I, I don't think, uh, parasites cause them to be fat. Um, you can, you can get enough of a parasite load that you have impaction, but, uh, I don't think as far as I know, as far as I know, uh, there's fat would not be an indication of parasites. I, I would look at the feces and see, uh, are they runny? Is there blood in it? Uh, that's there we go. Let's see. Okay. Long shot is sent the link. Uh, okay. Long shot found a microscope for me to check out. Thank you very much. I'll check that out. And Rob is adding on blood parasites require a blood sample and that drop is smeared onto a microscopic slide and stained. Uh, now Rob, how easy is it for us to do uh, blood, blood samples and blood smears at home? It seems it would be just as easy as the fecal sample. Um, and yes, Dr. Koch, thank you very much for being willing to jump on the chat and offer your insight. That has been very helpful. Thank you so much for sticking with us, uh, with this and doing this. Mikey saying, I hear it's healthy for baby chameleons to eat feces from the mother. Wouldn't that be a concern passing parasites? I've not heard this. Um, I'm not sure where in the world baby chameleons would find the feces from their mother in the wild. So this is a, this is somebody in captivity has decided to try this. And the only thing I can figure is it would be to, um, establish gut flora, but that's not a natural occurrence. I'd, I'd have to know the context of this. This is the first time I've heard about it. So uh, I will, I will not pass judgment on this until I hear more about the context. Um, and let's see, long shots asking no bloating. Uh, I'm not sure to do. Okay. I, I'm not sure the context of this. So I'm going to have to not, not speak on that. <laughs> um, all right, everybody, this is, this is the end of the stream. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with me here. Next Saturday, we're going to be having on Fram's cams. They are going to be, uh, we are going to be talking about the new Panther Chameleon Care Summary, which I'm going to release uh, for next week's episode, we're going to be talking about the care of panther chameleons. And obviously having Fram cams on, they do a whole lot of uh, chameleon breeding. And so bring your questions about panther chameleons. Uh, uh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much, especially to you, Dr. Koch, for being such a good sport and hanging with us. Uh, I Everybody, I promise I'm going to get find a time to bring Dr. Koch on where we can find a different Wi-Fi because uh, he is a wealth of information and it's wonderful. He's, he's one of the he's one of the vets that is a joy to talk to because he understands the chameleon world and he understands our mind in wanting to know. And uh, so he doesn't just give answers. He gives things to think about. And so that is just absolutely perfect here. Uh, and good old Gabriel, 
Tuesday live. Yes, I will be uh, Instagram on Instagram on Tuesday evening, my normal 5 p.m. Pacific time, and we'll be going live again and talking about anything that is uh, worth talking about about chameleons. So everybody, have a great weekend. Have a great week. And I'll see you next weekend, same time. And we are going to be talking with Fram's Cams. See you later, everybody.